Hello and welcome back to Inclusive Design 24 2021, brought to you with thanks to our platinum supporters, Intopia, Fable, TPGI Arc, and Adobe, and our gold supporter, Tetralogical. I'm joined by Joki Kamo, who's going to be telling you all about our next presenter. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Dennis Slembre talking about mouse accessibility. So let's get started with that. Seems really interested. It's interesting. We're all excited. Over to you. Thanks, everyone. And welcome to Mouse Accessibility, Inclusive Design 24. Let's get started. I've got a cover slide here with a the little mouse head icon. Um, and I'll talk more about in introducing myself in a second, if that's all, all right. But the agenda for today, um, besides a couple introductions, is what is mouse accessibility? We'll talk all about that. And then we'll go into um, several techniques to support better mouse or uh, accessibility and usability. Those include uh, large target areas, adequate target spacing, pointer gestures, pointer cancellation, the hover state, drag and drop, and uh, visually conveying text links. And we'll do a little summary and should be time for one or two questions. So of course on Twitter uh, for ID24, the hashtag is ID24. Uh, please feel free to tweet away during this tremendous event um, and any tweets on my uh, presentation would be appreciated. My handle is Dennis L and my company's handle D diamond is uh, DWSLA. So I am the director of accessibility at Diamond. We're an inclusive uh, digital agency based out of LA. More and more folks are remote nowadays, huh? Uh, but my past experience includes uh, DQ Systems, eBay, PayPal, BlackBerry. I contracted at Ford, Google, and worked at a few startups back in the day. Again, my Twitter handle is Dennis L. Um, I also run on Twitter WebAxe, W-E-B-A-X-E, -E, uh, longstanding a blog and Twitter account about web accessibility. It was also the first podcast ever, I'm pretty sure, on web accessibility. And I also run on Twitter Easy Chirp. Um, uh, that was the first accessible Twitter app that I had created a while back. Fun fact, I have four cats. You might hear one of them meowing a little during the presentation, so hopefully not too distracting. And on screen, there's the diamond logo and a headshot of myself. I'm a uh, light com com um, complexion, I guess, dark blonde to brown uh, hair and a scruffy red beard. And another factoid about me is I report directly to Joe Devon, who is the co-founder of Diamond. And he's also the co-founder of Global Accessibility Awareness Day, hashtag G-A-A-D. And that was started 10 years ago now, a decade ago uh, with, with Jenison Assumption. If you wanna learn more about that, <laughs> uh, go to globalaccessibilityawarenessday.org and on Twitter, GBLA11YDay. And on the screen, there's a, a photo of Joe in a nice jacket and a trimmed up haircut and the God logo. So what is mouse accessibility? First, let's talk about some inspiration. Like coming up on two years ago, I saw a tweet by Ryan Florence and he wrote, you hear keyboard accessibility, screen reader accessibility, but mouse accessibility? I've never heard anybody say that because it's the default. So we lump the others into a special accessibility box. But, but it's all just UX, only a matter of who you thought of. 
So I thought that was very interesting. In mouse accessibility, it hit me. I'm like, yeah, that is a thing, actually. But what he had done in the previous tweet is he said that he developed and almost shipped a drop down menu, a custom drop down menu, I assume, that mistakenly didn't have any mouse event handlers. Like it only worked with the keyboard. <laughs> so he was overthinking it for keyboard and forgot about mouse, which is somewhat amusing. But you know, in addition to basic functionality for mouse users or pointer device users, there are indeed numerous accessibility guidelines and techniques for mouse users. So what is mouse accessibility? Well, I would define it as optimizing the user interface. So users of pointing devices, such as a mouse, and there are others which we will cover, have the most usable experience possible. And on screen, just a little clip art of a standard mouse. So pointer devices and a mouse. So what do I what do we mean by that? Well, there's standard mouse, and there's a trackball mouse. Then there's the large trackball mouse. There are touch pads and track pads, track points, joysticks head tracking and eye tracking pointers, the stylus, like the Apple Pencil and the, the Microsoft Surface Pen, and fingertips on, on touchscreen devices. These are all different types of pointer devices. So here are a few device examples on screen. Um, on the left, the first one here is a uh, large trackball mouse has a large yellow trackball in the middle and, and, and two um, buttons on the top side of it, large buttons, uh, a joystick input device. So it's like a square rectangle with, with the actual black joystick in the middle to, to control the, the on-screen um, mouse pointer. Uh, and then a few buttons on that. And then another example of a track point. That's that old school little round red button thing in the middle of um, the laptop, in the, in the middle of a laptop keyboard. Uh, those, I don't know if you remember, but <laughs> they didn't really work too well for me. And here's a photo of a more typical trackball mouse. This is the one I usually use. Um, I've been battling uh, carpal tunnel syndrome for a little while now. It's finally getting a little better, but these are, are, are great for, for conditions like that and arthritis. Kensington is, seems to be a good brand for that. All right, so I mentioned my carpal tunnel, but you know who else uses alternative pointer devices. Well, sighted people, first off, <laughs> to use a pointer device, you have to have sight. Um, but sighted people who may have, you know, large hands or fingers that might make um, just a regular mouse uh, difficult to use. People with low vision who might be using uh, like a large pointer setting on the operating system. Folks with uh, fine motor impairment, dexterity issues, and there are uh, features in some operating systems like a sticky mouse feature, slow speed settings to, to help uh, with fine motor impairment. Gross motor impairment, things such as speech control, a switch device to control a pointer. And people with a cognitive impairment, of course, may use a mouse. And in this, further along in this presentation, we'll try to connect the dots uh, with these types of users and techniques. So alternative mouse users, here's a couple photos. On the left, there's a, a young man using a joystick input device sitting at a desk with a keyboard and computer monitor. And on the right, <laughs> I always, uh, I have a smile on my face when I look at this picture. It's a, a young girl, I don't know, maybe five or six, 
uh, wearing glasses with a with, with a um, <laughs> a smile on her face, looking at the camera, and she's sitting at a, a desk with a keyboard and um, a large trackball mouse. Here comes the cat. Okay, and just a reminder, usability for the win. Remember, like most accessibility techniques, mouse accessibility techniques enhance usability. All right, so let's get into some techniques. Large target areas, first and foremost. Provide large target sizes. So people using a pointing device can easily activate them. As simple as that. Enhancing the clickable area size is the name of a great article uh, by Ahmad Shadid. And um, it has, I think maybe it's two years old now, but it's a really good article. Uh, check it out if you have time, bit.ly slash click area, one word all lowercase. Um, in the next couple of graphics I'm gonna show you come from that article. Uh, the, the image on, on this slide, on the left, there is a hamburger uh, like toggle button, hamburger menu toggle button um, that has, that shows the clickable area like just tight on the icon itself. And then a click me with an arrow control and only the arrow is the clickable area. I'm an option radio button where only the radio button is clickable. So this is um, what you don't want to do. What's much better is on the on the right of that image is the same image, but larger clickable areas. So we got the hamburger menu icon, but just a larger, some more padding on it, right? A larger clickable area. The click me with the arrow has both the click me text and the arrow. So it's a much larger clickable arrow area and the radio um, together with that I'm an option label example label text um, all of that together it's much better to make the target area much bigger so that's what you want to do so web developers take note um, for things like uh, anchors and and buttons uh, use the CSS padding, that's a general rule to create that bigger hit area. So um, there's a little CSS, simple CSS snippet here on the right. So you, you don't wanna put the padding like on the container of that clickable element. Uh, you wanna put the padding on that anchor or button to make that actual target area larger. And on screen is a graphic of an, uh, an example of that. Um, there's a home button where the, the clickable area is just the word, but below that is an example where you want that that target area to be the entire uh, the entire button, not just the text. You want to do the whole thing. Straightforward, um, pretty common practice, but you'll be surprised how often that doesn't happen. So about the radio or checkbox, like example uh, for web developers, you know, just remember, of course, be posh, use plain old uh, HTML, plain old semantic HTML, uh, use that standard association between form inputs and labels, right? Use the um, ID and four attributes or use the explicit method or use an implicit method of wrapping the label around the input. Uh, do not use ARIA. So in the code example here, um, it's, it's just an input um, and, it, and it has an ARIA label and then it has on-screen text, um, but th that is accessible, but it doesn't make that association to make that entire clickable area happen. And this example on the bottom is more standard. It's using the, the ID and four attributes to associate, to make that large target area. So the, the actual label you can click as well as the actual input.
And a visual example of that here, the top image, you know, where the just a checkbox is clickable and that's not ideal. And then the lower image is much more user friendly where the entire um, checkbox and its label text are all one nice large target area. Okay. And um, oh, one last thing the, the WCAG uh, success criterion. Um, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines by the W3C. So I'll be mentioning these um, during each technique in this presentation. So the related technique here is WCAG 2.1, 2.55 target size. It's actually a triple A requirement in WCAG 2.1. And it says the size of the target for pointer inputs is at least 44 by 44. CSS pixels, except when another equivalent um, exists on the page. If it's an inline target, like in a sentence or block of text, if it's a user agent control, like so if it's control from the browser, or if it's actually essential for the content. And there is a really cool a uh, bookmarklet that you can use to test this, the 44 by 44 pixel cursor bookmarklet um, created by the awesome legendary Jared Smith, who is, I believe is speaking later today. And it was enhanced by our, our tech host right now, Adrian Roselli. And you can check that out uh, on CodePen, bit.ly slash 44 cursor. Four four cursor one no spaces of course or anything lowercase, and there's a screenshot of of that um, code pen. Okay, <laughs> that was a large topic, so let's move on. Uh, adequate target spacing. Provide ample target spacing to ensure targets can easily be activated by people using a pointing device without accidentally activating an adjacent target. So the idea is plainly put spacing in between your targets so that you don't click the wrong one. And on screen is an example, the top one is not good where there's barely any spacing at all between two rows of controls. And on the bottom there's um, marked with a, a thick yellow line, uh, much more ample vertical spacing. So the user is um, much, much less likely to click the wrong one. Now, I don't wanna get into the, the details on this. The slide explains it pretty well, but <laughs> in WCAG, uh, it's, it's a little bit messy, but it doesn't have to be. I kind of made it more complicated, but this is actually target spacing is a success criterion in WCAG 2.2, which is still a draft. Success criterion 2.5.8. Um, it was called target spacing, double A, but now they renamed it to target size. So it's more um, consistent with, with the aforementioned uh, WCAG 2.1, 2.55 target size AAA that we just talked about. Um, but now they're renaming that one to be enhanced. It's AAA. And this one, the actual target spacing is called target size minimum AA requirement. So this has a AA level, not AAA, but the target is smaller. It, the, the minimum target is 24 by 24, not 44. So, <clears throat> so just to restate all that, this is WCAG 2.2, 2.5.8 target size minimum, double A. Targets have an area of at least 24 by 24 CSS pixels, except where uh, the spacing, the target offset is 24 or more pixels, which we'll have an example of. And, or if it's inline, sentence or text block, and an exception if it's essential for content or if it's legally required. 
Okay, so these examples come straight from the um, WCAG 2.2 document. The first one, here's three similar images. The top one is a row, they're all a row of icons. The first one is 24 by 24 pixels uh, for each icon. So that passes because they're each 24. Even though there's no spacing between them, each is at least 24 pixels in height and width, so that passes. The second example, they are only 20 pixels in height and width, but there's an additional four pixels of spacing in between each. So because of that, that adds up to 24, and that therefore it's a pass. Now the bottom one, like the second example, the third example here is also 20 pixels by 20 pixels, but there's no additional spacing. They're all directly adjacent to each other. So that is a fail. In the next example, these controls are all much greater than 24 pixels in width, but they're only 20 pixels in height. But this is a pass because it's only a single row of controls. There are no targets above it, no targets below it. And this is a little confusing. I, I'm assuming that there's two pixels of blank space, like white space above and below this. So meaning that it is 24 pixels in height because there's no targets above or below. Um, I guess that's why I passed. That's not explicitly called out in the documentation. I think, honestly, the documentation is really confusing. So it took a while for me to digest it and try to simplify it. The second example here, it's the same controls, but there's um, another row directly adjacent below. Two rows of controls. They're both 20 pixels in height. But because they're adjacent, no spacing at all, um, that this is a fail because it's less than 24 pixels of um, height and padding or, or spacing, excuse me, margin or spacing. So the third example is more straightforward. It's like a drop, drop down fly out menu. Um, and then the first, there's, there's two graphics on the left is the pass. Um, each option in that drop down is 24 pixels in height. They are totally adjacent, no spacing, but again, it's 24 pixels in height, so that's a pass. The second one is 20 pixels in height, and again, they're adjacent, no, no spacing, uh, so that's a fail. Okay, introducing the new 24 by 24 pixel cursor bookmarklet. So I forked <laughs> what Adrian had done, who had forked it um, from uh, Jared's, and I created a new WCAG 2.2 version of this requirement, uh, 24 by 24 pixel cursor bookmarklet. So you can find that at bit.ly slash 24 cursor. And then use that bookmarklet, it changes your mouse to like a 24 by 24. Uh, square where you, you can, um, you know, use that against your controls and see if it's a, an easy, quick and dirty way to see if it's a pass fail. Okay, let's talk about pointer gestures. A gesture such as a pinch or a swipe on a touchscreen device is used, uh, a gesture such as pinch or swipe used for certain functionality must have on-screen UI controls which accomplish the same functionality. And on the screen there's a couple graphics, simple illustrations of a hand doing like a horizontal swipe and then a hand doing like a pinch gesture. So in WCAG, this is 2.1, success criteria on 2.5.1, pointer gestures, single A level. And it says, all functionality that uses multi-point or path-based gestures for operation can be operated with a single pointer without a path-based gesture, unless a multi 
point or path-based gesture is essential. So basically, we, uh, WCAG, this set success criterion wants to ensure that content can be controlled with a wide you know, range of pointing devices, people with different abilities and assistive technologies. And we talked about some of those uh, devices and people. So what does all that mean? Okay, here's a couple examples. So um, on the right here is an image of Google Maps. So that would be the first example, a website with a map that supports the, the pinch gesture to zoom in and out. But there are also plus and minus buttons uh, to provide that same functionality. So with um, you know, your fingertips as pointing devices, you could pinch in and out to zoom in and out, but there are also additionally um, with, my, with my finger or with um, um, any other pointing device, you can click these plus and minus buttons to zoom in and out. Example two, the dreaded carousel. <laughs> a new site that has, or, or any site really, that has horizontal content slider or a carousel uh, with news teasers that can move into the viewport via horizontal swiping. Fairly common. It also offers forward and backward arrow buttons for single point activation to navigate to adjacent slider content. So on the right here is an example of a web page um, on a mobile device. Uh, and it has like this carousel thing of products. So the user can swipe uh, to move the carousel, but there are no other controls, that's it. So if I have um, you know, dexterity issues or, or whatnot, or if I have a complicated um, eye tracking pointer device or something, I'm, I'm gonna have a problem with that. Or if I'm using a um, sc screen reader on a mobile device as well. But anyways, the example on the left is much better. Here we have um, another slider, but it has, um, in addition to horizontal swiping to move that carousel, there are right and left arrow controls where um, a pointing device can do just a single click on those controls to, to move that carousel. The user does not have to do that gesture. All right, pointer cancellation. This one's pretty straightforward. Ensure there's a way to cancel a mouse click. Make it easy for people using a pointing device to prevent accidentally invoking a control. One should expect to cancel a click by moving their pointer or finger away from the target before releasing. So you may have done this before, you, 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 you press or click on a target and you're like, oh no, I don't wanna do that. And then you, you can drag away the pointer off of it and release, and then it won't activate. So you wanna make sure that you maintain that functionality. And on screen, there's a simple illustration of a finger um, touching, uh, clicking <laughs> like a target with a red cross over it. Okay, so web developers, don't have to do much for this. Just please be posh, do that plain old semantic HTML, use native controls as always, anchors and buttons. Those will provide that behavior. If you must use JavaScript for um, click events, um, use an up event such as on click. That inherently is an up event, which works for, 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 for all devices, um, mouse, keyboard, touch. The thing to remember is don't use the JavaScript mouse down or pointer down events. That's the, the main point here. Designers for more complex interactions such as uh, drag and drop provide a method to abort, undo, and or reverse the input. So just a very simple HTML code here. The preferred, of course, is just a simple button element or a simple ahref. Um, and the example below is compliant, but really, you know, it's bad practice. Don't recreate a button. So the example is a div with a roll of button, tab index equals zero, 
but we are using on click, so that's good. Do not use mouse down or pointer down. And the WCAG success criterion for this is WCAG 2.1. 2.5.2 pointer cancellation, single A. And it says for functionality that can be operated using a single pointer. At least one of the following is true. To so do at least one of these, no down event, abort or undo feature, up event reverses the down event. And that's the quote, on, that's the, like the default one we talked about. Um, or if it's essential for whatever reason. <laughs> I love this mem here. There's a, a mem or a meme, uh, a graphic on the screen here. It's Obama like wiping his sweat off his forehead and says, whew, that was close. Now let's continue. So let's continue. Hover state, another old school, easy, um, but often neglected technique for just a better user experience, provide visual indication of the hover state on buttons and links. It provides feedback to the user, just basic usability. Don't make me think. If you don't know that book, <laughs> check it out. Um, there's a, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. It, the hover state helps the user conf, you know, visually confirm that this is actionable and it helps the user avoid misclicking. I'm periodically asked, question one, I'm often asked, do we have to provide a hover state or is just a focus state okay? <laughs> Designers are always asking that. And my answer is usually you should provide a hover state, but it's not required to be WCAG compliant. So question two, I'm periodically asked, do we have to make the hover state the same as the focus state? And my answer is no, uh, but why not? You know, consistency is always good. You know, people do change between input modes. It's more simple to design and implement if you're doing the same effect, but it does seem that the design trend right now, not that that's a good thing, but the design trend is to make it different. So. I'm really seeing a lot of this where um, there is, say, an underlined link. And if you focus on it, there is a, a box around it. But if you hover on it, um, then it's not a box. What happens is the underline goes away or something similar where the focus and hover states are different. So that's totally acceptable. Um, I don't know why it's popular, but it's fine. <laughs> I just assume if you can, just make it the same. I don't know. All right, drag and drop. Any functionality done by dragging with a pointing device should also be available using a pointing device, but without dragging. This is especially important for people using a head pointer eye gaze system or speech controlled mouse emulator. And this language really stems from the WCAG uh, documentation. So good job on that. There's an uh, on-screen image, simple illustration of a, a box but control thing with, with a hand, uh, a, a finger po pointing on it, and then an arrow moving pointing over to another box to the right. Whoops. <laughs> All right, so drag and drop. What are some use cases for drag and drop? Uh, sorting items within a list. Moving an item from one list to another. And that's the second visual on the screen. Moving tasks in a Kanban board. Adjusting the width of a spreadsheet column. That's the third or bottom image here on screen. Resizing or moving an object on a canvas, adjusting map view, and then also um, an input slider, um, a, a range element as the first top image shows. So the bottom two images, uh, image credit 
to Jesse Hauslet. So an example, an example of making drag and drop functionality, but also um, doing it with a pointer without dragging. Let's take a, a simple example here. <laughs> is a pointing device um, used on this input range or, or slider. The pointing device, um, you know, you can click on that round node and then slide it right or left to change the value. But a pointing device can also like click the arrows. We've added right and left arrows on either side um, so that any pointing device user can just do a simple single click on those arrows to change the value. And then also, if you want, as a bonus, you can add a text input. And that gives the user a third option as to change the value. Maybe um, they don't want or are not able to do the first two methods. So another method is just to input the, the value in the text box. Um, or maybe you know that has to be precisely input. <laughs> and um, that happens to me a lot actually, where I can't slide the thing exactly on where I want it. So if I had a text input, that would be fantastic. All right, and the WCAG criterion is from WCAG 2.2. Again, 2.2 is a draft. 2.5.7 dragging movements, double A. All functionality that uses a dragging movement for operation can be achieved by a single pointer without dragging unless dragging is essential. And there are a few um, examples that they talk about on the sufficient techniques document. So feel free to reference that G219 at bit.ly slash tech G219, all lowercase. All right, and last but not least, visually convey text links. An old uh, thorn in my side. Provide a clear visual style to text links. It's really that simple. I don't, I don't know why it has become such a big mess, um, designers. Please make it obvious. A person can't click a link if they can't see that it's a link. Don't make mouse users guess or search around for links. That's not cool. So if the text links aren't designed well and or I have um, a color deficiency or whatever, um, let's make those text links clear, right? Um, don't make me think. So this next slide uh, is the book I mentioned before in, in a tweet. And the quote, a user should never have to devote a millisecond of thought to whether things are clickable. I'm going to repeat that because I wrote it in the tweet here. A user should never have to devote a millisecond of thought to whether things are clickable. This comes straight out of uh, Master Steve Krug's book, Don't Make Me Think, Revisited. Um, tremendous, tremendous book. Can't say enough about it. I wrote a whole series of tweets about it uh, back in 2014. Um, and this is one of my favorite quotes from the book. So some anti-patterns, do not use bold, italic, or other indicators, which may be confusing to indicate a link. Uh, those signifiers tra traditionally convey something else, right? Like, like emphasis. And of course, do not use color alone. No matter what WCAG or anybody says, do not use color alone to denote a text link. So on screen, there is an example of some text on a web page. Uh, there's a heading and then a paragraph of bold text, a paragraph and a list of texts um, with more bold text and some italic text and then some more italic text. And I think there are a few links on this page, but if I can't visually tell what are the links, then, you know, that's not good. I don't want to go searching around with my mouse to figure out what's a link or not. That's just plain silly. So please don't use bold, italic, or color alone to indicate links. 
please underline your text links, blocks of text. It's simple, really. Just retain that link. Um, it's there by default. Don't remove it. And also reserve this underlining for links only. Don't underline anything else. Underlines on the web or on text or only for links. So the example on screen is the same text, except for there um, three of the bold or italic text were links. So now they're just underlying text, blue underlying text. So we're using color, but not color alone, right? We're using the underline, of course. Now I can tell what's a link, what's bolded text, what's italic text, all separate things. Now, if you have text as a link, there are some exceptions. Um, if you have an associated icon with that text snippet, that's usually acceptable um, as indicating that that's a link. And so pictured below here is um, um, a horizontal bar with um, some pieces of text, call now, about, partners, and they each have an icon right next to it. So visually, it's pretty apparent that these are actionable, that they're text links. Other exceptions could be main navigation and footer. So in this slide, taken from CSS Tricks website, on the top here, you know, like many sites, there's just some text here, some bolded text at the top. But the way it's designed, it's very apparent. This is um, very common on the internet that, um, you know, right below the logo and the horizontal bar, the, the main header of the page, that this is the main navigation and these are actionable text links. And same kind of thing in the footer, um, we've got at the very bottom of the page, we've got, um, you know, some, some lists of text with little categories above it. Um, and just the way it's designed and that it's in the footer, it's really obvious, it's very common um, that, these are, that these are links. And the WCAG success criterion, in case you're wondering, is WCAG 2.0, 2.0, 1.4.1, 1 .1, use of color, single A, color is not used as the only visual means of conveying information, indicating an action, prompting a response, or distinguishing a visual element. Um, failure 73, uh, the documentation particularly says, due to creating links that are not visually evident without color vision. Uh, there might be one or two other success criteria uh, that uh, could fit this, but I just picked this one as the one that's usually cited. And just real quick, my humble opinion here, the, the, the WCAG, unfortunate WCAG loophole, there's a sad face emoji here with G183. Please, please know that this is non-normative. It's not the standard. It's just a suggestion, and I completely disagree with it. Um, and you can learn about it at bit.ly slash G183 loophole. And this is where it says about the 3.1 or 3 to 1 uh, color contrast against link text against the uh, regular text, um, blah, blah, blah. Don't pay attention to that. Okay, and to further emphasize this point, one more slide on this topic, but a warning, the next slide contains profanity and possibly offensive language. So um, it's from Hayden Pickering presentation at Paris Web a while back. Uh, from his presentation, every interface should be black and white. <laughs> One of his just awesome talks. Uh, and, and there's a black and white photo here with Hayden on, on the left with a microphone standing uh, in front of his laptop. And um, you could see the first row of the audience. Um, and then in, uh, the main part of the photo is, is his slide projected on the wall. And it says, underline your fucking links, you sociopaths. And fucking links is um, underlined. So I thought that was pretty powerful. Um, maybe offensive, but it definitely drives the point home. So, th so thanks, Hayden.
Okay, so in summary, there are many types of pointing devices or alternative mice used by sighted people who may have large hands, low vision, cognitive impairment, fine motor impairment, gross motor impairment. You know, you just never know. What, um, that's one kind of, one of my golden rules of accessibility is you, you don't know what input device the user is using. Um, so just design and develop inclusively. And the techniques that we went over provide large target areas, provide ample target spacing, provide UI controls in addition to gestures, provide a way to cancel a mouse click, which should be easy. Provide a visual hover state on buttons and links or any actionable item. Drag and drop functionality is okay. I'm not recommending it, but it's okay. But if you do it, you should, it should also be available, that same kind of functionality using a pointing device, but without dragging and underline text links in blocks of text, please. Questions? Thank you very much, Dennis. That was just such a wealth of information in, in what seemed like you know, an incredibly short amount of time. Thank you. Uh, I know we've had some questions coming in. I think we've only probably got time for one, unfortunately, but go okay. for it. No problem. Uh, so the one question we'll ask you is the WCAG 2.2 criteria said that dragging movements should not be required unless they're absolutely essential. What are some examples that you have where is slash would be essential? That's a really good question. And if I had thought of one, I would have put it in the slides, but the documentation <laughs> doesn't really provide one and I can't really think of one, except the only one thing I could think of when you, when you come to one of those exceptions being required is a teaching moment. <laughs> so if you're teaching about drag and drop, um, you have to require drag and drop in order to teach it, in order to show how it works, in order to, to, to develop or design it, um, you must be able to drag and drop. So that would have to be my answer. Thanks for that question. <laughs> no problem. Maybe something around drawing, actually. That's the, the one that occurred to me. You know, if you were teaching uh, young people how to draw shapes or something on a, you know. Oh, that's a good one, Leonie. Thank you. Yeah. Nice. Like, <laughs> drawing certain things like drawing triangles and boxes and stuff, you know, could be done with single clicks. But freehand drawing, yes, that's a good one. Thank you. Freehand drawing would be a good exception. <laughs> No problem. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dennis, for your talk. Uh, to everyone who's tuned in, uh, please show your appreciation by heading over to our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash inclusive design 24 and hitting the like button. And while you're there, why not subscribe so you can stay up to date with all things ID24. Thank you very much to Joki, who joined me as guest host here. It's a pleasure to have you back and be part of the team again, Joki. Um, thanks for your help. A reminder that ID24 is a respectful community and we have a code of conduct that you'll find linked from every page across the ID24 website. And finally, of course, thank you very much to all of our sponsors, Intopia, Dable, TPGI Arc, Adobe, Tetralogical, Intuit, Infoaxia, the Center for Inclusive Design, Web Directions, AAA Conference, Adrian Roselli, LLC, and Cam Access. Without your help, none of us would be here and enjoying these 24 talks. We will be back in a little under 10 minutes.